This is Larry Harnish with part two of my reaction to Steve O'Dell's appearance on the From the Void podcast. If you get to the end of this video, you deserve a gold star because Steve rambles and the host does nothing to keep him on track. The good news is I did a little bit better on Steve Hodel bingo. I did get five in a row, so that was good for me. Again, this podcast is all about buying Steve Hodel's books, and I forgot to insert last time that the, the early years is currently ranked 1.2 millionth on Amazon. Again, a very friendly, non-threatening interview, softball questions, no challenges. But Steve Hodell says some really, really bizarre stuff, like saying that Elizabeth Short posed for Man Ray. No, that didn't happen. That never happened. It's crazy to say that. And it's really bizarre that the host didn't just go, whoa, 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 wait, wait, Steve, are you saying that Elizabeth Short actually posed for Man Ray? Because that didn't happen. That is Steve World. That is just Steve World nonsense. But in case you're wondering, Steve Hodell says he is, yes, he's working on another book. It will probably be, he's probably working on another book, but it's, yeah, 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 he's working on another book. He's got to do another book. Luckily, it's not about the Black Dahlia. It's going to be about Zodiac. So all you Zodiac experts, get ready to tear Steve Hodell yet another new one. It should be easy. And with that, so long for now. This is Larry Harnish with part two of my reaction to his appearance on the From the Void podcast. If you missed last time, From the Void is a podcast that's about astronomy and UFOs. And I guess it's because Steve Hodell by this point is from another planet or in outer space or some other cheap joke like that. I uh, always think I know what Steve is going to say. I've watched him a number of times, but he always surprises me like last time when he said his dad was reincarnated from a killer tigress. You just never know. Um, and that's sort of the adventure. Again, <clears throat> I wonder if the podcast hosts I have Steve on just to see what weird stuff he'll say because it's really softball questions. Oh, wow. And then how did you discover this weird thing about your dad? And oh, tell me some more weird stuff about your dad. Nobody ever challenges him. And of course, spoiler alert, Steve Hodell is very thin skinned, cannot stand to be challenged. And so he only goes on podcasts or appearances that are going to be very friendly to him, which I am not. I am going to dispense the usual snark. And again, I don't have a cinnamon roll to ease any butthurt that he might have. So let's share the screen and see what we have in part two. And away we go. Uh, yeah. Part two, more of the early years because you just can't get enough of, of, of George Hodel's evil stuff. Oh, and I'm going to have to talk through the From spooky the music. Space, boogie, 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 boogie. The deepest corners ah, of your mind. No. Ah. Welcome to From the Void. Yeah, I'm going to have to talk over this music so I don't get a copyright strike, uh, even though it's licensable and whatnot. Uh, so if the audio drops out here is because of the um, the spooky music. Okay, that's what's going on. Oh, scary, scary. Ooh, it's weird. It's weird. It's so weird. Oh, no. Ah. Spooky, spooky, spooky. Last week, I welcomed back retired detective Steve Hodell. Yeah, and so did I. I love listening to Steve Hodell and his weird, weird stuff. How weird is he going to get? How weird will it go? How weird can Steve Hodell get? Let's find out. Bring it on. To discuss his two new books, The Early Years, The Further Serial Crimes of George Hill Hodell, MD. Right. And 
Steve generally says that this is one long book. It's a continuation. It's a continuous investigation and uh, on and on. Steve's so-called case is so terrible that he keeps having to find more evidence and more clues and people send in clues and, hey, what about this? Oh, yeah, 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 that, that's definitely it. Um, he hasn't got into thought prints yet. Um, I don't know if he will, whatever the hell they are. Um, okay, bring it on. If you haven't heard that episode yet, pause this one and go back. Oh, yeah, go back and go back and watch my reaction to it because I had fun. Back and listen to part one first. If you've already heard it, then welcome back to part two. I, I've heard of Black it. Black Dahlia Avenger, the early years. I'm from the void. Spooky, spooky, spooky. It's spooky, spooky music. Ah! What are we going to do? Copyright strike. Will Larry Harnish get a copyright strike for this yeah, music? And it seems that every day that passes, it becomes exponential. <laughs> every day that passes, Steve Hodell digs up more bullshit about his dad. Oh, was he going to say that? Actually, more difficult to uh, to solve these types of crimes. I mean, we're coming up on uh, almost 100 years, you know, at this point. And... 100 years? Oh, uh, for the stuff on the 20s? Yeah, okay. Well, it doesn't matter if they're solved because Steve will say, oh, no, they weren't really solved. My dad did it. So it doesn't matter if they're solved. Steve, you know, has one answer. George Hodel killed everybody. It's just every unsolved killing on the planet, George Hodel did it. Yeah, it's simple. And as you mentioned in your books, you know, a lot of the evidence that existed at one point is now missing. And so. Yeah, Steve likes to say that the evidence is missing. Let's talk about the Black Dahlia case, because Steve likes to say that the evidence in the Black Dahlia case is missing. Well, there really isn't any. I mean, let me remind everybody that Elizabeth Short was found nude. Uh, they never found her clothing. They don't know what happened to it. They think they found her shoes. They think they found her purse. The killer mailed some of her property to the newspapers, and that's it. They have her fingerprints, but, you know, once once she was identified, those were of no more use. Uh, the, there's the uh, morgue report. But other than that, there really isn't anything unless Steve starts talking about all these crackpot letters that are, of course, his dad, because Steve always recognizes his dad's handwriting. Um, it's just very convenient for, you know, to Steve carry on and say, oh, the police bungled this, the police bungled that. They were corrupt. They were inept. Only I, the great detective, can solve it. We're going to have fun today. This is going to be fun. But you would think, as I'm reading this, my first thought is, if, if in fact, your dad is connected to even half of these, yeah, spoiler alert, no, he's not connected to any of them. Not one. That gives that gives us a lot more opportunity because hopefully there's evidence that exists in these other cases that might be able to link him to these murders and, and You know what? Let me let me point out that once somebody is convicted for a crime, the evidence is generally disposed of. It that that is not uncommon, uh simply because why store it? Un unless uh, they think it's like a murder case that's going to be appealed and they might hang on to the evidence. But that's not at all unusual. There's only there's a finite amount of storage space in property. I would assume there's at least some out there that still exists. Yeah, well, actually, let's take one of the cases. Uh, oh, goody. Here we go. I mentioned this, this dentist in Pasadena who got killed. Oh, yeah. This is the, the Sphinx murder. Uh, that is unsolved and let me let me point out, i did a whole i did a whole response to this thing because uh in reality steve's dad was up in san francisco when this guy was killed couldn't possibly have done it it was final exams week in medical school in san francisco so there is absolutely no way george hodell did it now let's see how steve hodell will talk around that inconvenient little fact or if he even addresses it I'm guessing no. Uh, and he was known as the Don Juan Dentist. <laughs> you know, they always came up with na cutesy names for the crimes. And uh, he was a, a, a handsome, intelligent uh, dentist practicing. Yeah, the handsome, the handsome dentist. Okay, sure. In Pasadena. And they're certain that it was a uh, crime of passion, revenge crime. Uh, 
just before he was murdered, a woman comes to, um, comes to his office all excited and tell as, as women always are in Steve Hodel's stories. Tells him something. And then he immediately leaves. He says, well, I guess I need to go. So he tells the secretary, I'm, I'm off. I'm, I'm out of here. He goes downstairs. He go, walks over to his car. And, and let me point out that the, the so-called Sphinx murder uh, is, is called that because the individual, the victim was killed near the Masonic Rite Temple. And there's a couple of Sphinxes out there. And of course, the newspapers jumped on that because the riddle of the Sphinx, the Sphinxes saw who did the murder. But of course, they will never tell. Boo, spooky, spooky, spooky. And the killer is lying in wait and shoots him in the head. So they're pretty calm. Yeah, as uh, George George George's Hodel signature of shooting people in the head, or cutting them in half, or mutilating them, or whatever. Yeah, they're all the same, obviously. It's a, some kind of a revenge killing. And again, they do their you know they they do their stuff, and they come up with the name of a suspect who they believe is good for the crime. And I believe it. I believe it was my dad because I want it to be my dad. Steve is just going to will this evidence into existence. Based on their description uh, that it was George Hodel. I don't know if you want to. How are we on time? Are we okay? Oh, we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Take all the time you want to, Steve. I, I, I love the Sphinx murder. Absolutely. Uh, let's see if I have it here. I can read you. When I read this, in the, this was actually published in the newspaper. And uh, Knowing what we know about George Hodel, uh, you tell me if this, uh, I can find it, you tell me if this sounds anything like um, uh, who they're talking about. I mean, I, I couldn't quite believe this. Uh, here it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <sighs> okay. This is an article that was uh, published in the newspaper. Which newspaper? What date? What about your dad being in San Francisco at the time of the killing? Are, are, are we going to get into that? We're going to talk about how your dad was in San Francisco uh, in medical school uh, and it was final exams week when this guy was killed. Are, are we going to talk about that at all? Or are we just going to let that float by? Because I know the host isn't going to bring that up. And I'll read it to you because, just because it's, it's so distinct in its description. Now, this isn't a, this isn't a, this isn't a, this isn't a crime profile. This is actually somebody they've identified and know who, who he is. What, what newspaper is this going to be, Steve? How, how about a citation? <clears throat> and I'll read it that big head, in big headlines. It says society friend in quotes, potential villain. It says, uh, oh, society friend, potential villain. Yeah. Well, that sounds like George Hodel, who was up in San Francisco in medical school. Um, Moving through the mystery shrouded drama of the murder of Dr. Leonard Seaver, there is, it was learned last night from an authoritative source, a potential perfect villain. Unlike the procession. Yeah, we know who the perfect villain is. The perfect villain is always George Hodel. Okay. ...of women attracted to the slain as, 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 that's the, Steve's just losing it. You know, it's sad. It's just, come on, he, you're, you're reading it. You're just reading it. Okay, come on. The villain had no love for the brilliant fellow who graced Salon so well. Boy, that's a tough call. The guy who, the killer didn't like the victim. Wow. That is brilliance. <laughs> Okay. There's reason to believe it was pointed out that he had a jealous hatred for Seaver. Yeah, the killer had a je jealous hatred for the victim. How often does that happen? Doesn't that happen often? Even though pretending friendship for the man he may have marked for death. This suspect is believed to be a dope addict. That, that was easy to yeah, okay. Now, Steve has never done anything to establish his dad as a 
drug abuser. Nothing ever. There's no, no proof of that at all. Steve has just sort of willed that into existence with all of other his, all of his other alleged uh, crimes that he accuses his dad of. It is known that he has flown into frenzies, apparently under influence of morphine. No proof that George O'Dell ever did that, especially since he was in medical school in San Francisco, Steve. Or some other narcotic. Among his intimates, his analytical mind has often been mentioned. He's possessed, some say, with a native cunning, which with real or imagined reason might be turned into diabolical shrewdness in concocting and carrying out a plot, such as had a denouement in the cold-blooded murder of Leonard Seaver. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You have a crime of passion, but it's cold-blooded murder. Is, is, is anybody gonna call Steve on that? You've got a crime of passion that's cold-blooded murder? Anybody, anybody gonna challenge Steve on that? Hmm? Now the host won't. Okay. The finger of suspicion has not yet been pointed directly toward this man. It is felt, however, that should he have written Seaver's death warrant, he would almost certainly have provided himself with a perfect alibi intelligent oh yeah like being in san francisco in medical school when it was final exams week that would be a perfect alibi i wasn't in town and suave victor in many a battle of wits in pasadena drawing rooms able to just yeah battle of wits in pasadena drawing rooms again let me point out that george hodell was in the bay area this whole time he was in uh college and then he was in medical school so george hodell wasn't around let's let's see how steve establishes that his dad was because steve likes to say that his dad lived four miles away or something like that okay let's see guys his suspected dope addiction the man is a dabbler in criminology phlegmatic enough normally he is said to have become passionately fond of a woman a woman among the scores with whom Seaver was acquainted. Did his passion flame to fury because he believed Seaver had won the woman's heart? Did this Okay, here we are, crime of passion, but cold-blooded murder. You can't have it both ways. You just can't do it. Amateur of criminology become a ruthless slayer. So, I mean, it's almost a, it's really a perfect wow. description of George. That, Steve, Time out. That is so broad and generic and general, it could apply to almost anyone. And of course, the host is going to go, oh, wow, that's amazing. Practically gave uh, the police uh, George Hodel's address in San Francisco. Uh, Dad was in many debates in Pasadena salons at the time. Uh, 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 Dr. Seaver was a patron of the arts and music, contributed to it. So he would have, he would have been, uh, there would have been that connection probably. There's, there's nothing. Steve is going to talk around the fact that there's no connection between his dad and the victim because there wasn't any. With the music. So, I mean, I think it's, so I was so confident that I had put together enough on this case to. Uh, oh yeah. He goes down to the Pasadena police department and uh, talks to the folks. Uh, clear it. I actually went to Pasadena PD some years ago. I think self-promoting author shows up to try to link his dad to unsolved crime. Um, how do you think that played out? It was back in 2015 or so. And I, I set up a meeting and I did a PowerPoint, an hour PowerPoint presented the evidence to. Because Steve loves PowerPoint presentations and spooky music. Actually, I thought it would be one of the detectives, actually the chief of police. Because uh, <laughs> the detectives are too busy to listen to Steve's bullshit, maybe. Uh, sat down with me and went through, and just the two of us one-on-one, -on -one, and I went through the whole PowerPoint with him. I said, now these documents, the person has been identified, he's going to be either in your file or the DA's file. It was actually... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Steve likes to throw on throw around this stuff about the district attorney's files. 
if nobody was ever charged, none of the doc, none of the material would ever go to the district attorney. <clears throat> and Steve should know that for somebody who was working in the criminal justice system, somebody is arrested, the police present their case to the district attorney, the district attorney reviews it and decides whether to prosecute or not. That's how the system works. So if nobody was going to be prosecuted, if they had never brought the case to the district attorney, the district attorney would have buckus about this old murder. That's the reality. The DA would have nothing. And Steve ought to know better than that, having been a cop, having been a detective. He should know how the system works. It's just a joke. The DA's investigator that linked this guy. And he said, well, I'll, I'll have our guys take a look and we'll see if George Goodell's name is in there. So, okay. Yeah, I, I think the file is missing. Huh? Why, why would a 90 year old file on an unsolved murder be missing? I think it's missing. And uh, uh, a month went by, nothing. So I called and talked to him. He says, Well, he says, Yeah, all of the uh, records have disappeared. We don't have anything on the case. And uh, apparently, I said, Well, what about the DA? I said, Most of this. He said, Well, he said, I don't. Steve. Why would the district attorney have anything if nobody ever brought a case? How were you ever a cop? You know how the system works. It's ABC. Simple. My guys, I think, went down and checked. I don't, I don't think they did. We saw yeah. My guys checked it out. There's nothing, nothing to be found. Because nobody was ever charged. The case was never sent to the DA. They wouldn't have anything. This is just idiotic. And people who are inexperienced or naive about the legal system, the court system, the police, you know, law enforcement, you know, Steve can just talk circles around it. It's like, that's not how it works. Yeah. It's like very frustrating, but, um, you know, again, reality can be frustrating for crackpot authors who want to accuse their dad of every killing on the planet. Yeah. Without any hard physical evidence, DNA, fingerprints, you know, it's almost at this stage, it's almost impossible to take it to court. Well, you would take it to court, he's dead now, but it'd be impossible to, you'd need that to say some case solved. They never took it to court. That's why the DA doesn't have any records. And uh, so we'll probably never really know, but there's just so much there that just screams out George Odell. And one of, one of the things I'd love for you to kind of go back on too that kind of links to what we were just talking about there. Um, a oh, are we going to get into George Hodel, boy reporter, uh, writing with the homicide folks, writing for the LA Record? Oh, I hope we get into that. A lot of things that you uncovered about his his youth um, kind, of, kind of lend to that. So, oh, and I, I should point out, because it's really funny, uh, we have IQ creep. Steve generally says his dad had an IQ of 186, but in the last tape, he said his dad had an IQ of 187. Um, I guess, you know, it's just some random high number uh, that didn't pass along to, to Steve. Uh, okay. Like, for example, one of the things I thought was interesting is he is a pretty prolific writer. Oh, I think we're going to get George Hodel, cub reporter for the LA Record. I love when Steve does this. Early on, especially, you know, starting in high school and he's writing these essays and winning contests. But what's curious about it is he always kind of writes about the same theme. Yeah. So talk, that talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, so basically, uh, We've talked a little bit about his his uh, nine year old piano. Yeah, let me point out that George Hodel was not playing concerts at Shrine Auditorium. Little Georgie played a piano interlude during a day of long, boring speeches. That's what happened. Shrine Auditorium, if you don't know, is a big barn seats thousands of people and the idea of doing a piano recital in there to anybody who knows anything about music or acoustics is a joke uh but yeah steve will t will say that and people are so dumb and gullible they go oh yeah okay no 
no, didn't happen. Nope, nope, nope. Prodigy played his own concerts. At Shrine he's Auditorium. He's highly intelligent with his very high IQ. Oh, what is, is he going to say it's 186 or 187? Now, in reality, it was more like 151, but let's see what Steve says. And in high school, he's two or three years ahead of his other students, graduates early. But in high school, um, he writes in both his junior and senior years, he writes in the, uh, in the high school annual. Uh, and the first essay. Wow. Writes in the high school annual. Whoopee. He writes about is an essay. He talks about an insurance, uh, a, a woman and her husband and insurance policy that she failed to get. Anyway, the whole subject about it is about death. And then in his second and his senior year, he writes another story and it's a, it's a fictional story. Short. I assume the first one was also fiction, right? Right? Story where he talks about a alpine hiker and his buddy. And they're hiking in the high uh, snowed mountains and uh, a glacier comes along. <laughs> a gl <laughs> I was just hiking and this glacier came along. As glaciers will do, those rapidly moving glaciers. God. And it kills them both. Again, it's the subject of the essay is death. So in both of these, he's you know focused on and 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 um, fixated on the subject of death. And this is at what fourteen, you know. Uh, and then uh, of course the other real kicker is um, so after he he has an affair with a professor's wife. Oh oh oh, oh. yes 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 pregnant. yes right. Uh, she uh, she has well it may be a professor's wife maybe not. We're not sure. She has a child, names it Folly. Well, maybe, maybe not. We're not sure about the e that either. Steve will ask his readers, does anybody know about whether this is real, the story, but I've been saying for years. Ah, but she's going to say, George, you're a child yourself. Here it comes. Breaks up her marriage. <laughs> she goes east. Uh, and he's, now he's, what, 15, 15 years old, 15 or 16. Has this affair, breaks up her marriage. She goes east, has the child. George, George you're a child yourself? Dad goes yeah! back east, says, I love you, I want to marry you, I want to raise our child. And the woman says, George, you're a child yourself. Yeah! Got it! <laughs> he loves that story. And so do I. But not for the same reasons. <clears throat> this whole thing is a bit of a terrible mistake. Get out of my life. Okay, so there's a big rejection. But uh, he comes back. Steve doesn't know if that story is really true. He just likes to tell it. He, he's posted on his blog. Does anybody know if this is true? Was it a professor's wife? Maybe it was just a friend's wife. I don't know. Uh, did he really have a kid? I don't know about that either. Uh, of course, he's, he's asked to, after a year, he's asked to leave. Cal now he's going to be a cub reporter for the LA record, which was the, okay. Steve's going to, well, I don't know if he's going to say it or not. Let's, but he is, He's lining up. He is approaching. He's in approach mode to the George Hodel Cub Reporter story. Let's see if he okay. can. So he gets a job as a cab driver. He's driving around. Interestingly, he's driving out of the Biltmore. Yeah, Steve doesn't know that. Steve has no clue about that at all. Steve will say, oh, yeah, my, my dad knew Lamert Park where Elizabeth Short's body was left. Uh, because my dad knew it from a taxi cab as, when he was a taxi cab driver. It was like, well, that neighborhood didn't exist when George Hodel was a taxi cab driver. Nobody will challenge Steve on that either. But we don't know if he was driving out of the Biltmore. Nobody knows that. And uh, another cabbie next to him is a guy, a young guy who's going to law school. We don't know that either. This is all just, Steve has just pulled this out of the air that George Hodel and William Parker the cab driver. Oh, I just spoiled that story. My bad. Uh, knew each other. It was William H. Parker. <laughs> he, will grow, he will grow up to be Chief Parker, uh, LAPD's most famous uh, police chief. And he's driving cab with George back then. I'm not saying that there's any connection, but just uh, even though I don't believe in coincidence, let's call it a coincidence. 
Steve, that is hilarious. If there's one thing Steve Hodel believes in, it's coincidences. Steve manufactures coincidences, as a matter of fact, and calls them evidence. And name, in quite, case in point, the, uh, the map torture uh, that he does about all this symmetry, which he tortures, tortures, tortures uh, into a bunch of coincidences that in reality don't exist. Okay, bring it on. Uh, but then he gets a job and he hires on at 17. He lies about his age uh, and, he, and he gets a job. The LA Record. The LA Record. Yeah. The large major newspapers. Okay. One sure way to make Steve Hodel mad, which I love to do, is to say that the LA Record was a little nothing paper. And I've, I've got a whole nother uh, video about the LA Record being a little nothing paper. You can look it up. It was the smallest of the papers. It was struggling. They would obviously hire anybody. More to the point, there is absolutely zero, zero evidence that George Hodel ever wrote for the LA Record. There isn't a single clip file, nothing. Uh, to be fair, reporters didn't get bylines in those days, but there is absolutely nothing. So unless Steve Hodel has a bunch of his dad's clips and say, yeah, yeah, I wrote this, there's nothing. This is all just wishful thinking, absolutely unsupported with any sort of evidence at all. And he's a crime reporter, <coughs> naturally. And this is during prohibition. So he starts writing. Oh, 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 we're going to get the judge's wife. And there's there's no evidence to prove that either. Steve just pulled that out of his, some portion of his anatomy. ...around with LAPD bicycle. And they're kicking doors. Kicking down doors and they're arresting the judge's wife. Doors and taking the judge into custody with the young 22-year-old blonde. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Usually it's the judge's wife. This is the judge and some girl. Hmm. I think that's a variation. I, 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 think she, I think, as shocking as it might be, I think Steve has changed the story. And uh, he's writing these tabloid articles about the judge and the blog. And, and then he's going he's gonna to graduate to homicide. On that star. Then he graduates and he starts riding around with LAPD homicide. And he starts going on these calls with on the, to the murder scenes. And again, there's no, there's absolutely nothing to support any of this story. Zero. Tabloid articles, the bloody ace of Oh, 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 the ace of spades next to the body. You know what? You go through the LA record, you cannot find a story about an ace of spades next to a body. I know, I've looked, it's bullshit. It's all Steve Hodel making some things up. Diamonds next to the woman, you know, and stuff. And next to the woman. Next to the woman. Oh, that's not how he tells the story. Wow. No. So he's buddies with, you know, the homicide detectives. Actually, in the early years, there's a there's a big tell on this that a huge connection. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, George Hodel knew too much. We don't know what he knew, but he knew too much. Uh, that goes a long ways to explain a lot of the cover-ups. But I, I want to leave that for your readers to discover. But it's... It, it's in Book 7, 8, 9, 10, The Rock Opera, The Book of Haiku, Children's Letters to the Black Dahlia Avenger. It's in there somewhere. Steve actually... As much as I'm making fun of it, Steve actually has written a play, uh, and it has his dad killing his secretary. It's nuts. I'm not making that part up, believe it or not. It's a huge, you know, I thought I had figured out the reason for the, you know, why didn't they pursue the, the uh, Dahlia case? He didn't do it, that's why. It's real simple. They had all the evidence. They had it. There's no evidence. George Hodel was eliminated a, as a suspect after five and a half weeks of surveillance. Uh, they interviewed people, everything, all of that tended to eliminate George Hodel. It's in the DA's final report. It's confession on tape. And That's not a confession and it's not on tape. It's wire recorder. The, uh, it was Thad Brown was the chief of 
detectives at the time. And uh, yeah, let me point out that Steve has done nothing but attack Thad Brown, who was one of the most respected detectives uh, in the LAPD. And Steve has just hung all kinds of garbage uh, against Thad Brown. It's absolutely, I would say it's unconscionable. Maybe Steve Hodell has no conscience. It's indefensible what all of Steve Hodell's claims about Thad Brown. That is wrong. Basically, there was, I don't know if you recall this or I've mentioned it, but there was actually a murder occurred during the stakeout. Oh, no. Oh, this is, you know, well, wait a minute. Now, Steve, boy, okay. Let me back up because the host isn't going to do that. <clears throat> Steve was talking about how his dad was a crime reporter, and then he's gotten diverted into Thad Brown, and there, a woman screams on the tape. Pardon me, the recordings. They're not taped, they're wire. Uh, a woman screams, and uh, Steve has talked himself into that being a murder. And, oh, these guys are monitoring at Hollywood Station. Why didn't they do anything? And it, the answer is because they're not stupid. Let's see how far Steve gets into that story. And boy, the host is doing a terrible job of keeping Steve on topic. So these, they have these 18 detectives staked out at our home. 24-7. Home, uh, audio staked out. Microphones in the walls, not a code tap. For six weeks, 24-7. 24-7, what did I tell you? 18 detectives. And on the third day, uh, I'm reading the transcript, which we uncovered 55 years later after my book came out, we discovered the secret of... Let me point out, because it's important, Steve Hodell never, ever, ever asked to see his dad's LAPD file in the Black Dahlia case before he wrote his book. It was only afterwards when he accused the LAPD of a cover-up. Didn't ask to see it. LAPD detectives tell me... If Steve Hodell had come to them before he wrote his book, they would have let him see the, his dad's file. He didn't do that. So, so much for the cover-up and conspiracy by the LAPD. Dell transcripts, DA's office in the vault. I'm reading the transcripts and it says, uh, Hodell and uh, Baron Haringa go downstairs to the basement. There's a Blows are heard. A woman screams. Blows are heard. More, more blows. The woman screams again. And I'm looking at this and saying, what the hell's going on here? Why aren't they out the door over there? They're five minutes away at Hollywood Station to a rescue. They, they do nothing. Yeah, because they're not stupid. They knew, being experienced law enforcement officers, that uh, George Hodell was a smart guy. He knew the house was bugged and they were putting on a show for the microphones. That's what was going on. It was all fake. It was all staged. And the cops, not being stupid, didn't fall for it. That's all it was. Anyway, and there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, we, don't, we won't go into other reasons why. They didn't, yeah, the, the reason they didn't do anything is because they're not stupid. I, I don't think Steve is going to get into that one. But uh, they didn't. And I think that was probably, you know, LAPD, you have to understand the timing. Parker was literally weeks away from taking command as the new chief. So, oh, yeah. Um, Steve's got this weird thing about how William Parker didn't want to uh, expose or something uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the investigation as he was coming in. So uh, he said, well, we'll get back to it later. And they never did. But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you're coming in as the new police chief, you're going to shake things up, possibly, potentially, like exposing this. Um, not in not in Steve world. That's not how it works. No, 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 no. Basically, um, I think they said, look, he's left. He's out of the country. He's fled. Maybe we find him. Maybe we don't. Yeah, he fled. George Hodel didn't leave the United States, the continental United States, for a while after that. And he went to Hawaii, which was, let me remind you, an American territory um, that it was admitted to the U.S. In, in 59. And so if they had wanted George Hodel from Hawaii, they certainly could have extradited him. They didn't do it because they didn't want him because he didn't do anything. Let's go 
let's lock this away for now. We'll come back to it, but let's clean up Dodge, get rid of all the corruption. Yeah, and, and let me point out, it is very convenient for Steve to say, oh, yeah, 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 the LAPD was corrupt. Let me do a little LAPD history because Steve is never going to do it. Um, the LAPD had a corruption problem in the 1930s in terms of job selling. Okay, that's, that is the, the misconduct generally. Um, and so there was a recall in 38, new administration, new police chief named Arthur Homan. He didn't last real long. And so uh, Clemens Horrell uh, came in as the World War II police chief. And then he resigned uh, for various reasons and was replaced by a Marine general named William Wharton, who was police chief for a year. And then there was a competition uh, for the police chief's job, and it came down to William Parker and Thad Brown. And Parker ended up being police chief. Uh, but that's what really happened. Uh, during his one year or so as police chief, Wharton investigated throughout the department and found uh, in his words, a few bad apples, but nothing pervasive. Uh, and it is really, uh, it is really a, it, it's a lie to say the LAPD was really corrupt in the 40s. Was it brutal? It could be. But I mean, it, it's not like you would buy your way out of a traffic ticket like you did in Chicago uh, or anything like that. So that is really uh, untrue. And the only reason Steve floats that whole thing is to, well, the police were you know, inept or corrupt, and that's why they didn't charge my dad. In reality, they didn't charge his dad because he didn't do anything. That's the real story. I move forward. And I think that was basically what they did. Of course, they never came back to it. So, Because um, he didn't do it. But, so there's that connection, Thad Brown, or uh, I mean, uh, the DA ordering that Thad Brown, all of the records be turned back to Thad Brown. That didn't happen either. Okay. Boy, Steve is just mangling this story. It's amazing. Here's what really happened. <clears throat> During the Black Dolly investigation, uh, there was a rogue investigation within the LAPD, not conducted by the Homicide Division. It was done by uh, the police psychiatrist, Paul DeRiver, and he boondoggled the uh, gangster squad into going along with him. Uh, didn't tell Homicide uh, that he was investigating it or anything like that. He's just did this rogue investigation um, of this poor schlub named Leslie Dillon, who wrote to him and said, hey, I think I have some ideas about the Black Dahlia case. And um, DeRiver decided that Leslie Dillon had a split personality. And that under this split personality, and I'm not making this up, under this split personality, Leslie Dillon killed Elizabeth Short. And so he, Paul DeRiver lured Leslie Dillon to come out to work for him. They questioned him. Uh, that, it's a whole saga that I don't really want to get into now, but it blew up. Uh, and as a result of that, the grand jury investigated the handling, mainly this rogue investigation, but they also looked at uh, the LAPD's general conduct, um, the general handling of the Black Dahlia case. And that's what really happened. Um, but it's, you know, and let me also point out grand jury proceedings are by law secret. So yes, of course they're secret. So when Steve says, oh yeah, yeah, these files were uh, ordered handed over to Thad Brown. No, none of that is true. Absolutely none of that is true. All the files were kept in the district attorney's office. Uh, they were there, they were taking up room. And so during a records purge, they were shoveled into some boxes and generally ignored but not open to the public until Steve's book came out. So, and I, if he gets into it, I'll have more to say later, but I think that's enough for now. That was the case. So that's what they did. Anyway, in the early years, we'll see how this all connects in the early years. It's just ama amazing. I thought, I, I thought that was the answer, but there was another couple of more answers lying in wait for me in the early years. Yeah, so it's it's, it's so interesting now we we know today so much more about serial killers and the psychology behind serial yeah but george odell wasn't a serial killer and let me point out elizabeth short was not the victim of a serial killer it was not a serial killing it was one of a kind there's nothing like it before or since armchair sleuths tough 
one of a kind. Others than we ever did before. Um, and obviously back in those days, there's nothing like a national database, there's no DNA testing, none of that type of thing. Uh, but at, as you're investigating all of these early crimes, we do know now that, you know, typically serial killers, you know, their first crime is kind of half thought out, it's a little sloppy maybe, and then they sort of escalate as they almost, for lack of a better term, perfect their kind of MO. Yeah. Um, is that is that kind of the story that you saw as you were uncovering these unsolved crimes? Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 yeah, well, they're all different. You know, some people are shot. Leonard Seaver was shot. Um, Gene French was stomped to death. Um, you know, it, it's just all over the map. But in Steve World, they're all consistent. They're all they're all similar. They all have a signature. Yes and no, I guess. Um, he was he, even at his first crime at what I'm saying is 14. It was pretty well thought out. The the child prodigy of, of serial killers, obviously. It wasn't you know it wasn't a random killing. It was it was definitely premeditated. Um, and he used a lot of the stick crime signatures that he would use much later in life to actually alter. Oh, is, is this the one where it's, it's the priest that he lures him out supposedly, and the guy is shot in the head and buried, which is not like any other of the, of the cri so-called crimes. Is that what he's going to say? Through his crimes, he used them even that early, and uh, uh, so. Again, but you're not dealing with your average person, you know, he's because of his high intelligence, he's and, and he saw himself as a Moriarty, as a master criminal, you know, a, a, from the get go a, and the taunting and ultimately, of course, his ego. Hang on a second. I want to make sure that I'm recording here because I just had a horrible feeling. No, nope, I'm recording. OK. would be his downfall, you know, the uh, fact that he had to conceal. Actually, on the Zodiac stuff, he was challenged by a cryptologist, the, the most senior uh, cryptologist in the world, wrote and said, you know, you don't have the guts to put, to put your... The most senior cryptologist in the world? Who would that be? Oh. Nothing to show George Hodel was Zodiac at all, zero. Name in a cryptogram, because if you do, I'll solve it. Well, that challenge went out to George, and of course, he couldn't resist it. <laughs> and he did, and the guy didn't solve it, and nobody solved it up until, you know, uh, this, French, this Frenchman in Paris, you know, 16. Oh, yeah, and it was the all the Celtic symbols or something like that, um, because the Hodels are Celtic or... Zodiac was Celtic or something? Years later. So, uh, you know, most of these crimes were, were pretty pretty well thought out. And uh, again, you can't... Except for the crime of passion against Leonard Seaver, which was impulsive and not thought out. Or was it? Because George Hodel was in San Francisco. You can't think of George as a 14-year-old. You have to think of him as a man in his, at least in his 20s or 30s, you know. Even at that young age, he had that kind of a mind and brilliance. Uh, but he, there were mistakes. He, he, he did leave clues. He did leave enough clues that, uh, for if you're a trained homicide detective, you... yeah. You know, Steve has done so much to trash his reputation with all this goofy, all his goofy claims. You just might find them. <laughs> and yeah. uh, of all the ironies that I would grow up to be a homicide detective for, with 300 murders on your butt. 300 solves! Yeah, and I was confident I'd be able to show we had nothing to do with this. You followed the evidence. Yeah, what, what's interesting too is, you know, we, we talked about his youth and his childhood, and I'm always fascinated by what, what goes into the stew, per se, that results in creating, you know, a serial killer, a monster who's, you know, murdering without remorse. Yeah, George Hodel hated humanity, which is why he became a doctor. That's why he was charming. 
course. And, you know, so you talked a little bit about his, his childhood and his, his upbringing and kind of how strict it was and how he had a hatred for his mother. And then, you know, on top of that, he's just this brilliant kid, this prodigy who is kind of setting himself up for it. He's got this fascination with murder. Um, he's, you know, he's writing for uh, these local uh, publications and he's... <laughs> he's writing for the, the high school annual and Steve would like him to be writing for the uh, newspaper, but not really. There's nothing to show that happened. Going to crime scenes, <coughs> and making friends with law enforcement and the uh, homicide detectives. And so he's... This is all made up. This is all Steve world fantasy. Clearly, as a smart, smart kid, smart guy, he has a pretty firm understanding, I would think, of how the homicide department works and what they look for. And he's, I'm sure, taking mental notes on every trip he goes on. None of that happened. That's all fantasy. Right. And, of course, as he grew older, and he, he got more and more power. And ultimately, you know, he gets the position, you know, he does his... He's still surgeon at a logging camp. He starts out as a young doctor. Yeah, surgeon at a logging camp. Now, let's let's slow up here because a logging camp facility is not set up for surgery. Uh, he was a doctor apparently at a logging camp for a while, and then he became a public health doctor in New Mexico. <clears throat> but let me point out that log, a logging camp, by definition, is primitive. Uh, he would have been doing first aid, uh, emergency response, that, that kind of thing. Anything serious or major is the guy, the the individual, the patient is going to be transported to the local hospital where they have real facilities. So no. And and George Hodel was never a surgeon. Never, never, never. That is all Steve World fiction. In Arizona. And, uh, uh, no, it was in New Mexico has developed high skills in surgery. No, no, not at all. Never studied surgery, not a surgeon. He knew just enough surgery uh, to graduate from medical school, and that was it. He then moves on uh, to, to Arizona and New Mexico and becomes a, a district health officer for the state. Then in the 30s, yeah, I, I think it was that was at the county level rather than the state. I could be wrong about that, but he was a public health uh, doctor in New Mexico. Uh, had to do with rabies, uh, tuberculosis, that kind of thing. That's what George Hodel dealt with, and of course, venereal disease. Uh, and we're gonna we should hear more about venereal disease soon. <clears throat> Let's see if we do. He commits that murder in, in, in the mesquite, he commits that 1938 murder. Oh yeah, in the weeds, uh, that that Steve just randomly says, oh yeah, yeah, my dad did that. And then immediately, within weeks, leaves and comes to Los Angeles, joins the LA Health Department, quickly rises to the top. Oh, he's gonna say he was the head of the health department. Now, he was head of the um, communicable diseases uh, portion of the health department. He was never head of the entire health department, never. That is again uh, a, a Steve exaggeration. I mean, just within a few years, he goes from new guy, newbie on the job, to the, the senior health officer for all of LA County. No, he was in charge of communicable diseases. He was not head of the health department, no. And in VD, specializing in venereal disease control. Well, communicable disease, yeah. So he's the VD czar of Los Angeles. He's got all the files on who's doing what to whom and who's who's getting infected. And it's the politicos, it's the cops. You really think politicians are getting VD? No. Let's let's have a reality check here. <clears throat> what really happened was George Hodel opened up a clinic in Little Tokyo during World War II. Okay. Why Little Tokyo? Well, people of Japanese ancestry were off in internment camps, so Little Tokyo was empty. What happened was you have Black Americans leaving the South in the Great Migration. They're coming to Los Angeles, okay? Los Angeles is a segregated community, and they don't want Black people living oh, around here. So where can we put Black people? 
I know. Well, let's put them in Little Tokyo because the Japanese Americans are gone. So they put the black people in Little Tokyo. They rename it Bronstown. And it's either Brownstown or Brownsville, one or the other. Anyway, and George Hodel opens up his clinic there. So it isn't the high rollers and the politicians and stuff. It is the impoverished blacks coming from the South. Uh, that's who his patients are in reality. Not in Steve World, but in reality. You know, he's also performing abortions at that? No, no. There's nothing to show that he was performing abortions at all. That is a lie. Matter of fact, George Hodel was opposed to abortion. It's in the uh, newspaper clippings about him, against it. Um, secret abortions. So he's, you know, large and in charge. He's really what 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 you would call an untouchable. You know. No, not at all. If he was untouchable, how did he get arrested? Huh? Explain that one to me. He had so much on so many. And then when I got into the early years to find out how much more he had because of his early relationship with police from those early years, you know, and these are the same players. They've also, as he's rising to the top, these young detectives are rising to the top, you know, and um, he's really got it by the wells for sure. No, no, none of that's true. Absolutely not a word of what Steve Hodell just said is true. Nothing. And, and he's got a lot of power, and uh, and not only that, but everybody is scared to hell of him. I mean, you know, a, a lot of his surrealist friends, man. People were scared of George Hodel. No. No. Nothing to show that either. Ray and a lot of the others knew, you know, after the fact, I'm not saying they were involved, but they knew that he had committed the Black Dahlia. No. That's a complete lie. Absolute lie. None of it's true. There was a whole inner circle that knew. And they were, you know, terrified. Uh, you know, basically, they, they had not, wanted nothing to do with George after that. They... Oh, wait a minute. So Man Ray was terrified of George Hodel, and yet he was the family photographer. Is that right? Do I understand that correctly, Mr. Hodel, Detective Hodel? Man Ray was terrified of your dad, and yet he was the family photographer. Would you care to elaborate on that? Uh, I don't think the host is going to ask that question. You know, basically, we're kind of running and hiding from him because he knew they knew. And uh, this, that was his ultimate surrealist uh, masterpiece, so to speak. You know, this, this body, the posing of the body, uh, and I go into a whole thing of murder is a fine art. Utter garbage. Utterly ridiculous. Which was this whole surreal dream thing. And, you know, that was the difference between George and the surrealists. They talked the talk, had their wine. He walked. They really talk about killing people, Steve. I don't think so. Off the walk. He actually did it. You know, he went out and this was his masterpiece. And he pays homage to Man Ray and uh, on the body with it, multiple different things. So this is just so crazy. Amazingly, they all pay homage back to George after the fact. And, yeah, they were so scared that the, of him that they paid homage to him. <sighs> what are you saying? In their some of their artwork and all of this, like this is probably going to be a strong theme in the docu series to explain this because you have to- Oh yeah, the, the docu-series, Don't Hold Your Breath. I really believe there was no difference between the dream state and the waking state. And if you go there, you can do anything, you know? And I think this was all part of his sickness. I know it was. Part of his madness was this whole idea of nothing matters. You know, do what thou wilt, to be the whole of the law. But... Yeah, so that's why he was a doctor. I mean, it's just, None of this makes any sense. None of it. Wow, that's, yeah, that's really. Yes, yeah, Steve. <laughs> yeah, wow, Steve, do you have some daddy issues there? Uh, I don't think the host is going to say that either. Steve, you have some really weird ideas about your father. Um... Interesting. I remember reading that portion of of the book where you kind of present some of Man Ray's works. I think it was the Minotaur was the one specifically that he modeled. 
Now, is Steve going to say that George Hodel introduced Elizabeth Short to Man Ray or that Man Ray Elizabeth introduced Elizabeth Short to George Hodel? Is he going to go there? Um, that's a wild story. And of course, none of it's true. Um, Elizabeth Short's, um, you know, the way he posed the body after and it side by side, it's, it's eerie, you know. Yeah, let me point out that the, the Minotaur photograph was a uh, cover for a magazine, uh, an art journal, a French art journal uh, called The Minotaur. And when Man Ray fled Paris because of the Nazis, he left that behind. Uh, that was the only print of it. And it's very unlikely anybody could have seen it in America um, because he left it in France. Man Ray left it in France. Um, and the way Steve Hodel discovered it is the way Steve Hodel does research. He was just sort of flipping through a book of Man Ray photographs and said, oh, that's got to be it. And that, you know, he built all of that out of the Minotaur. It, it is just garbage. How, how's well, that and, and considering that Man Ray's Minotaur is a woman whose body is cut in half and you know, posed in that position, that the hands above the head, like what we would call a surrender position, is what they call the Minotaur position. And there's much more that I came up, you know, again, another another reader came up and said, well, yeah, Steve's armchair slews really, really lead him around by the nose with their, their with their nonsense. It's pretty amazing. Steve will just accept anything. Take a look at the Lady Equivoque by Man Ray. And in that, it's a woman who I believe actually was Elizabeth Short posing for Man Ray. OK, there he said it. Elizabeth Short posed for Man Ray. No, that is absolute, utter bullshit. No, 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 no. So indications that she was posing for a number of years <coughs> back then. No. And I believe she posed for this. You want it to be true. Lay in 1943. Okay, now that is absolutely impossible for the simple reason that Elizabeth Short was only in L.A. for a couple of weeks and then went up to uh, Camp Cook. So very, very, very unlikely. Uh, and she was with uh, she was with her dad at that point. Um, very unlikely that any of that is true. It's just Steve willing things into reality. And the gullible host goes, oh, OK, oh, wow. And it's a woman whose face is uh, Chris, well, the hair is Elizabeth Stewart. It looks, everything about it looks like Elizabeth Stewart, but the face is crisscross patterns. Uh, and you know, crisscross, uh, cross hatching is a art technique that goes back centuries. It is certainly not new. It was certainly not invented at this, you know, in the 1940s. <sighs> Concentric lines cross. Well, Dad carves that crisscross pattern on her hip, on her naked body. Uh, and again, an homage to Man Ray from his earlier work. And it's just, I mean, there's just so much. So much. now I've got like nine or ten. This is just so nutty. Man. Introductions, I discovered another Man Ray drawing in the, I think he did it in the late 60s. And it's a, it's a minotaur. Uh, the top part is a minotaur, a uh, half man, half bull, and it's bleeding out, and the bleeding out forms its legs and lower body. And again, you know, it's just like, it, it's really crazy to make stuff, it just doesn't stop all the linkage. Yeah, and this is the type of crowd he was hanging out with, which I'm sure is just feeding into his kind of delusional world of... of... Yeah, let's talk about feeding into delusional worlds. Uh... Mr. Host, because you're the one who's enabling Steve to just keep repeating this crazy stuff without challenging him. Not a word of challenge. Just, oh, tell me more. Oh, tell me more. This is just crazy stuff. Dreams and and uh, reality and, and dream states uh, kind of blending together. Um, right. Surrealist art will definitely, uh, it's definitely a, a different kind of unique form of art. And I can, I can assume that, uh, that probably lent well to his kind of mindset already at that point. Right. And, you know, I had always thought of Dad as the scientist. You know, I never thought of him as really being into woo-woo stuff or, you know, 
metaphysics or that. But then, you know, he wrote me a letter, which I printed in Buckley Avenger called, I called it the parable of the sparrow. And it's a interesting letter in that he talks about, uh, it's a very personal letter to me. And he talks about other dimensions that lie behind and within another. And it's, it's quite metaphysical. <laughs> and and uh, it's the only time I've ever heard him go in that direction. You know, basically, uh, I mean, I married an, a, a rather well-known Hollywood astrologer to the stars, right? And <laughs> huh? Oh, is that Keo? I, I can always tell that he always felt that, you know, Steve, you know, you know this is like going <laughs> to get sucked into this stuff. And um, uh, anyway, I, I was surprised until then I realized this letter was very revealing in that sense that there must, there must have been something there he saw. Now, whether he saw it from a scientific standpoint, you know, the multiple dimensions and stuff uh, could be, but it was, it was an enlightening letter. That's so interesting. It kind of leads me to uh, one of the things I want to ask you about is, you know, you talk about in, in the, the latest books, um, just the fact that he had such a unique, uh, in both. The, remarkable life. He had a remarkable life. The Black Tally murders, the Lone Women murders, the Zodiac murders. There's a very specific and unique uh, MO and crime signature. Yeah, they're all different. That's his signature is they're all different. Talk about what makes it so unique. What was so different about the way that George um, performed these murders that kind of stands out from your normal kind of crime of opportunity? Well, of course, the first thing that jumps out is, now I had 300 murder investigations under my- 300 solves. No, in my years at uh, Hollywood homicide. In zero of those, none of those, have I ever had a suspect who's writing and taunting the police. Okay. Let me point out that letters to the police, letters to the newspapers, was rather common uh, in the 1940s. Not later on, perhaps, but definitely in the 1940s. It was the thing to do. There was a lot of crackpot mail, uh, not, not just in the Black Dahlia case, but in general. Not unique at all. Not unique at all. Uh you know, and, and uh, yeah, it's just, a lot of the handwriting is disguised. Some of yeah, uh, Steve Hodell's big on recognizing his dad's handwriting. He loves to recognize his dad's handwriting. Well, it's cut and paste stuff. But in, in most of George's crimes, he's doing this. And again, it comes back to the ego. You know, uh, it's I'm smarter than you. Catch me if you can, you know, that type of thing. Um, so that's that's very unusual in itself. Um, also, of course, he's all over the place with the victims. Uh, there's no, you know, the. That's actually true. There, all the all the killings are different. That's why you know. A lot of profiles will tell you, well, we have a specific victim type. As far as I'm concerned, that's BS. Uh, you know, he was all of children, young women. Yeah, this is where Steve goes off the deep end. <clears throat> no, this is this is baloney. Um, he, a number of men for revenge. A number of men he's, he killed, like like Doctor Seaver. Um, there's another one in the early years that I mentioned too that apparently had found out information about it. So he actually follows. That's pretty unusual. It is pretty unusual. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't want to get into serial killing, but it's it's pretty unusual. And he flees. He's afraid he's going to be killed. Sure enough, he flees. And this is in the 30s, uh, late 30s, I think. And he flees and he kills him in, in uh, forget what, in St. Louis or somewhere. Um, not St. Louis. Um, anyway, he flees and follows him back east, shoots him and incredibly leaves, signs this, he knew too much, and he signs the Zodiac sign on it. This is in the third. Oh, yeah. George Hodel always knew too much, and um, yeah, the, the, the victims are all killed differently. That's why he did them. Please. The circle and the cross. 
And um, so I think that was a revenge, or you know, so he was afraid the guy was going to reveal something that he accidentally discovered about George. And there's a number of killings like that. Um, yeah, there's just another, just lots and lots of random killings that Steve attributes to his dad. It's really sick at this point. And uh, so, you know, basically, and of course, the other thing is the extreme, the extreme overkill. In other words, he, he, he did it all. Strangulations, gunshot, knife, rope. Um, did he use a wrench? Did he use a candlestick? Was it a, a, uh, in the candlestick with a wrench? Or pardon me, in, a, in, the, uh, in the conservatory with a wrench? In the study with a candlestick? Sounds like a game of Clue. Most of them were strangled with either a wire or a rope. Uh, in one young lady, he hung her from a tree, actually hung her, um, in one of the San Diego crimes. Um, so he, I'm pretty sure that's San Diego. I, I forget the details of it because I haven't looked at it in a long time. I'm pretty sure that particular murder was solved many years later. I'm pretty sure. You know, the... the, the the overkill, the stomping on a number of them after they're dead, he stomps them so hard on the chest that the rib cage punctures the heart. Yeah, now let me point out that's the Gene French killing that he's talking about. And what Steve will not tell you is that the killer left heel marks and shoe prints all around the body. And they photographed and measured those heel prints, and the killer had very small feet. Which, unlike George Hudal, who had big feet. Steve will never tell you that. You have to come to me to find out that stuff. He did uh, cigarette burns to the body. He did that with Elizabeth Short. No, no, that's not true. Elizabeth Short did not have cigarette burns. God, how was he ever a cop? How was he ever a detective? He's just loony. He did that with another victim, one of the, the in the mesquite victims, the, the the young daughter, not, you know, she's in her 20s, uh, cigarette burns. Very unusual. I never had any cigarette burns in any of my cases. Cigar or cigarette. Um, but so the overkill really stands out. Uh, that's a pretty unusual uh, to the extent that he was doing it. And, and the extended torture. Um, and uh, so. Basically, he, he kind of jumps out, especially, you know, and I, of course, I recognize a lot of handwriting that wasn't disguised. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, Steve recognizes his dad's handwriting. Maybe nobody else does, but Steve will. Up, oh, dad's handwriting. Up, oh, dad's abo. Up, oh, dad's signature. Up, up, up. I thought, you know your parents' handwriting, and your listeners know theirs, and I know my father's. And even though... And some of them he disguised it, met, and it several he didn't. And it's, it's very clear that his, his writing, a lot of the Zodiac stuff is clearly George Hill. I had, I sent it to the, the uh, San Francisco st the state uh, investigators up there on Zodiac to have it analyzed. And they came back and said, well, we, we can't say it's his, but we can't eliminate him as the hand. Yeah, let me point out that the people who study Zodiac and are experts in Zodiac which I am not, are just absolutely brutal when it comes to Steve Hodel's claims. You think I'm tough on Steve Hodel? I am nothing. I am a walk in the park compared to the Zodiac people. They just rip Steve a new one all the time. Doesn't stop him. As the author of the Zodiac writers. And um, so, uh, and that's what's frustrating. I mean, I, I think there's potentially, there is, who knows what evidence is left in many of these crimes, but, you know, uh, I have Dad's full DNA profile. And... What would you compare it to? Uh, I got, I have offered it to all of the San Francisco law enforcement agencies. There's five or six up there in their handling Zodiac, except for none of them, you know, crickets, no response. Why would they? You're just a uh, self-promoting author trying to hang a bunch of crimes on your dad. Um, I 
Um, so finally, I said, F it. And I uh, published his full DNA profile in, in the early years. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Take it or not, you know. Yeah. I mean, you'd think that at the very least, just to so you'd stop bugging them, you know, like they would just test it, you know, rule them out if they don't believe you and uh, they'd yeah. be done with it. But they don't. Yeah, it's interesting that they. Well, but on what, here's one of the problems. Yeah, they're not going to waste time on something that's going to be uh, just generate publicity for a uh, an author who's trying to get some ink. And that's all Steve Hodell is now at this point. He's a publicity hound. That's it. With DNA with Zodiac, they've got five or six different samples from different agencies. Best I can tell, they have never compared them to each other. You know, Steve, it would be good if you have all these solves to say, you know, yeah, I mean, I can place my dad in San Francisco. My dad was living in the Philippines at that time, but I can show that he was in the Bay Area on these dates. I can show that he was in. Steve hasn't done any of that. He hasn't laid any of the groundwork. He's just decided, oh yeah, my dad did that. Oh yeah, my dad did that. Oh yeah, my did that. Unbelievably. Oh. And you know, again, it's ego, territoriality, nobody's gonna solve my case. And so if they compare, I don't, we don't know that there's any actual uh, confirmed zodiac DNA in the existence because number one, they haven't compared it to my knowledge. And if they had, they would have said, we have Zodiac's confirmed DNA. You know, all I need is two of them to match. And then they, they could say confidently, you know, we have his DNA, but they don't. And, and I, I suspect any one of them could be his DNA or none of them, you know. So that's the other problem. And uh, again, the egos and, the, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but I've never counted on law enforcement. I've always felt my readers or my judge and jury. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting because um, I think you talk about this in the second book, the Black Dahlia Avenger 2, um, just by virtue of publishing the first book and getting it out in the public eye, all of a sudden, you know, folks who were involved or related to people who were involved or around at that time, you know, all this additional evidence starts to come forward. Let me point out that Steve Hodell wrote Black Dahlia Avenger in total secrecy. Nobody knew what he was working on, uh, and that was deliberate. Uh, he slipped a copy to Steve Lopez at the LA Times, didn't want anybody to see it, especially didn't want me to see it. Um, and I, 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 I read it, Steve Lopez had me read it, and it's like, nah, this is garbage. But more important, the reaction within the Hodell family uh, really ticked off a lot of people, uh, including Steve's half-siblings like Tamar and Duncan. Let me point out that Duncan Hodel stopped talking to Steve uh, because of the allegations in Black Dolly Avenger. Um, that's, that's what a success it was, and that's, that's the reaction it brought forth. Yeah, let me point that out. Um, and so you start out with what I thought was a pretty decent mountain of uh, of evidence to begin with. And again, you even talk about it, the fact that there's not necessarily a smoking gun, which is frustrating, but you've got all this circumstantial evidence. It's a mountain of it. And then you've got even more. It's a mountain of something. That's for sure. That comes about as a result of the first book, which results in the second book and the third book. And at, at some point you just have to say like, I think we got our guy, you know? No, we don't have to say that. We, did, we don't have anybody. George Odell never killed anybody. No connection to Elizabeth Short. It's all just made up. It's all manufactured, every word of it. Yeah, well, absolutely. And there are many, many have, come, have, have agreed. I mean, you know, you've got the- Yeah, and many have not agreed, like me. And let me point out that Steve Odell is a pariah within the LAPD. Um, and I will leave it at that. Um, yeah, no, a pariah within the LAPD. Law enforcement, you know, this is mind boggling where you've got the top, four top cops on LA, uh, or in, in LA saying the case was solved. It was no, 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 no. Steve likes to do this thing where he has uh, confirmation from beyond the grave, uh, 
people who are conveniently dead saying, oh yeah, you solved it. In reality, nah, none of that's true. It's all wishful thinking. Um, and none of these people can defend themselves. None, nobody can contradict Steve Hodel and say, no, it's not solved. And I can, I can give you a list of three or four or five LAPD homicide detectives who say Steve Hodel is full of it. Not at all. Not at all. George Hodel, I mean, what more do you want, you know? Reality? How about a little reality, Steve? And, um, and basically, LAPD's position has been, I've been through, what, three chiefs now with letters and saying, you know, let's just do DNA. And with what? With what? What is there from the Black Dahlia case that would have DNA? Certainly not the crackpot mail because they don't know that's from the killer. The only thing that they know legitimately from, was from the killer was the envelope of her property um, that was mailed to the newspapers. And the killer, very shrewdly as it turned out, uh, wiped everything down with solvent. So there's probably not any DNA. But other than that, there isn't any. Well, they've all had the position, <laughs> well, we're just too busy with other crimes to uh, take a look at this, you know, and. and... Yeah, we're, we're not going to, you know, help out this publicity hound who's beating the department up uh, for being corrupt. Why should they help Steve? They won't. You know, they don't know what busy was. I mean, when I was working in the. 70s and that was busy we were getting a thousand murders in the county and we were getting in hollywood we were getting just hollywood division which is one of 18 divisions and now i guess there's 21 but back then it was 18. we were getting like 120 so what every a new murder every three days per up so you're saying wow you know what i have homicide statistics for uh city of la and la county and I think you're wrong there, Steve. Um, there was a time there when a lots and lots, there were lots and lots and lots of homicides. And then the homicide rate has dropped off, but at one time it was really, really high. That's busy. You know, I think wow. they had 350 murders for the entire year. You know, so, and they've got a cold case unit, which we never had back then, which specializes only. In, so it, it, it's BS. Yeah, and, and you know what, Steve? Um, the cold case unit um, told me that, you know, if there'd been any, anything to Steve Hodel's claims, we would have said, okay, just to get it off the books, but it's nonsense. Uh, and that is from somebody who was in the cold case unit. They say you're full of it. They say you're full of it. Yeah. Cold case unit LAPD says Steve Hodel is full of it. Yes. The problem is these are the two, you know, Parker and Thad Brown, Chief of Detectives Brown and Chief Parker, were the two greatest heroes on LAPD. They were my heroes. You know, Parker and Brown were, were on a job when I was with them. And they were truly our, my heroes. And so that's why you trash Thad Brown so much. Is that right, Steve? So they don't want to, you know, they, they don't want to throw mud on their two greatest heroes. and. They can't defeat the evidence, so all they... Yeah, they can. I can defeat the evidence. ...can do is say we're too busy with other stuff, you know. They are. And that's been going on for 22 years. <laughs> and it seems like even though there's not, um, you know, we don't don't have a ton of evidence left over, because obviously, as, as you said in the books, like a lot of it magically disappeared. Uh... There isn't a lot of evidence in the Black Dahlia case. There's nothing to disappear. Um, or got misplaced in, in some form or fashion. There's still, you know, obviously handwriting samples that, that you can analyze. There's potentially a DNA profile. Um, no, there is nothing to link any of that crackpot mail to the killer, zero. Doesn't matter if George Hodel was, you know, writing dozens and dozens of letters um, because you can't prove it. You can't prove he killed it. He can't prove he killed her. No. You know, obviously, it, you know, it'd be fairly easy, and you've done it. You've placed him in those locations at that time. Um, his entire background kind of lends to the fact that 
He had the skills and the know-how. No, he didn't. And he had no connection to Elizabeth Short. He was eliminated as a suspect. You're just, Mr. Host, dude, you are just enabling this crazy old guy who lives in a trailer park and rants and raves about how his dad killed all these people. And he didn't kill anybody. And the interest, you know, so there's a lot of other things that you can look at. Um, you know, back in those days, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they didn't think 50 years ahead and thinking that one day something left behind like DNA or, you know, handwriting because we have AI technology now and, and things of that nature would come to bite him in the butt. And you'd think that eventually one of these days through, you know, advancements in technology, they'd be able to at least put a stamp on it and, you know, confirm it. Absolutely. And, and as far as the handwriting, I, my expert, I got a you know, court certified expert who came back and identified multiple samples of his handwriting and said, this is definitely George. It's been 23 years now and there's never been a handwriting expert that's come out and said, no, it's not. Okay. How many, how many experts have you submitted it to, Steve? Have you cherry picked? your handwriting analyst to get the results that you want? Hmm? Like maybe your German software, uh, you know, your your German uh, facial recognition software where you cherry pick it certain, certain images and say, oh yeah, yeah, it's Elizabeth Short. Yeah, not big on that. Wow. No, nobody, has, nobody has said no. And, and they won't because they know their reputation would be on the line. And, and uh, if, you know. Yeah, anybody who gets tied up with, with Steve Hodel, the reputation is on the line. And there are several people who have tied up with Steve Hodel who no longer talk about him. Case in point, Steve K. Um, no longer talks about Steve Hodel, no longer talks about the Black Dahlia case. And he will say, no, there wasn't an LAPD cover up. Steve is wrong there. We do ultimately get some DNA or something. Uh, so nobody has contradicted it. And, and uh, uh, they could easily do it. I mean, you know, but they're not going to because, and, and others have looked at it and said, well, inconclusive. You know, it's like, I can't really say yes or no. You know, not enough samples. I need lowercase handwriting or something, you know. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's been very frustrating, but it's also been very rewarding. I mean, like I say, these armchair detectives have been amazing. Yeah, Steve has a whole uh, cadre of enablers who fall for his garbage, uh, and they enable him. Sad. There, any one of them could be my partner any day. You know, I mean, <laughs> really, some amazing thinkers out there that come up with stuff, and uh, and I credit them in the book. And speaking of that, while I'm up on the subject of crediting, buy my books, buy my books. I want to credit a good friend of mine. He's a retired. Dallas, Texas police officer. Oh, is this the map he's a guy? Photographer. Uh, he's an author himself of fiction, history fiction. His name's Robert Sadler. And Robert did all the graphics for me in the early years and, and, the, and some of the editing, quite a bit of the editing. And he's just been, we've been friends for, I don't know, it's been 10, 15 years. And he's just an amazing guy. Viability. And again, it's yeah, he's the one who did the the map of the 50 foot lone woman uh, murders in, in Hollywood to, to make that look like uh, all these these murders that were distributed over a wide area were actually a very small confined area. That's what kind of guy artist he is. The 50 foot lone woman victim. Just initially connecting on the e uh, email, you know, and, and ultimately we met and, and uh, he's just been a huge help to me on this and still is. Uh, I'll leave, I'll give you a little taunt here. I would just within the last few days, literally, um, I was contacted by, uh, right now, he wants to go by anonymous for now, by an individual. And he's basically come up with more evidence on the cryptology, on the Zodiac ciphers, and, uh, there's always more. Really there is always more evidence. There will always be more as long as Steve is breathing. There will be more evidence because Steve can never get enough to bolster his crummy case against his dad. I, I'm thinking I might update uh, most people to and add this as a new, ah! but it's very dramatic. <coughs>
Beyond Most Evil, Most Evil Meets Dracula, Most Evil Meets Billy the Kid. Uh, new evidence that's, uh, you know, again, just keeps on confirming more and more. So I'm, I'm real excited about that. <laughs> it never stops. It's like... <laughs> No, it never stops because Steve just keeps it going. Steve can't get enough. Steve can never get enough. My boys say, Steve, well, I did move. I hope I told you. I, you know, I'm up here. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I was in, I, you know, I was pulled back from Bellingham after my initial retirement, what I thought was my initial retirement for 22 years to LA and write the eight books. And then my son's last year says, Dad, you know, it's time for you to retire, you know, it's, you know, come on, dad, you know, give it. Yeah, give it up. Give it up. It's nuts. Oh. And come yeah. back up here, come, and there, you know, one boy's in Seattle, one's in Bellingham. And I, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, they're probably right. And uh, when it got to, you know, these, I'm tired of these 105, 110 degree days here in <laughs> Sherman Oaks, California, you know, down there. And so I moved up last November, I found a house, and as I sit here, I'm looking out at the San Juan Islands and the bay, uh, and, the water, wow. and the water, and it's, I think it's about 67 out, and uh, I really love it, it's been really good for me to make the change, uh, although I do think I may be stuck with one more book. <laughs> There's always one more book, always one more more proof because Steve can never have enough. It's a sickness. It, at this point, it is a sickness because it's not reality. It is totally unattached to reality. Totally disengaged, totally detached from reality. It's sad. Was it, there was one early years crime that I, again, it was like the, in the mosquito. It was too, it's too much to, it, it's a book in itself. So I'll, I'll probably have to, probably will do that and uh when i joined lapd you know i the reason i joined lapd new breed part of the new breed at 21 was that i could retire in 20 years in 20 minutes so i could retire at 41 you know i'm now reevaluating that and looking at maybe 85. <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's got to be tough because uh, with every new book you put out, you know, I'm sure new evidence continues to come in. And then you're like, oh, gosh, like, yeah, I, I think I need to do another one, you know? So. Yeah, it, it, it's or update. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm definitely going to have to update with this new evidence on Zodiac because it's, it's a kind of a, a wow moment when I when I read and saw what he had come up with. And it's it's um, so, yeah, I mean, no. No, no, no. The idea of Steve Hodel having another Zodiac book out. I mean, I'm the Black Dahlia guy. So what he says about Zodiac is like, doesn't mean that much to me. But the Zodiac people are just going to fry him more than they have already. They just fry Steve. And, uh, at some point, uh, I feel, and you know, I'm not the type that's, you know, sits in the rocking chair and says, well, it's really a pretty day out. You know, I, I need to keep my mind active, you know. And it, you ought to try that. You ought to try that rather than living in this parallel reality of, of Steve world where your dad was this maniacal killer because none of it's true. It's good for me. I just, just turned 80, you know, and it's like, okay, it's time to, you know, uh, why not keep going, you know. Yeah, well, you're sharp, sharp as ever. Um, you know, you're absolutely. I, I can tell just in the the last time and and this time talking to you that uh, there's a clear reason why you were so successful as a as a detective. Um, you know, you're you're absolutely mati No. Steve is further and further around the bend. That's the reality. Steve's claims are crazier and crazier and crazier. Uh, and he keeps changing the details. If you don't know, if you haven't listened to him, for haven't been listening for 20 years, you wouldn't know. But it's like, wow, he's really changed these stories. Ridiculous. And, and that's one of the things that I love about all of your books as uh, you really dive in there and, and create a very, very compelling art. An alternative reality. 
argument that, uh, you know, in my opinion, it's uh, pretty, pretty open and shut at this point. Yeah. Crazy. Well, I, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, and there are a lot of luck that agree. I mean, I've had so much support and from an awful lot of people. I mean, even in the reviewing of my books, you know. The... Yeah. Let's talk about the branches of the Hodels who don't like your books. Let's talk about the branches of the Hodels who think you're a big liar. Okay. The Michael Connellys of the world, and the, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Michael Connolly says the Black Dahlia case is insolvent. Just in case you want to know that. A lot of really respected people have. Yeah, like James Elroy, who who refuses to to discuss you now, like him. Have come to support me and say, yeah, case closed, and uh, and a lot, quite a few in law enforcement too, you know. Yeah, there I can I can name off the top of my head probably five current and former LAPD homicide detectives who say Steve is full of it. Um, so no. And as I said, he's a pariah within the LAPD. And they, you know, they're used to putting cases together and they know when you've made it across that threshold and it's, it's actually a pileable case. And the early years were a challenge because some were less strong than others, but there's some very top infamous cases there. I mean, you know, I haven't gone into names. Uh, I kind of like to leave that for the surprise. That Buy my books you know, for the readers, but th there are some very, very headline, they were headlines for weeks uh, back then, B big stuff, and uh, other people have tried to solve them and stuff, and I think I make a, a pretty solid case on most of them. Some are not quite there, you know, but, but uh, again, it was clear that I'm not blah, claiming blah. these are solved, I'm saying you, you be the judge. Yeah, and I, and I love the, the way that you present it in the book. I thought that was uh, a really fun way to kind of present the information and allow the reader to kind of take the evidence that you've presented and kind of make their own determination at the end. I thought that was a really creative way to do that. Thanks. Creative. Yeah, yeah. Steve is creative. And, and, and I have a, a very good, a very talented reader doing the, an audible on the books. We'll start. Well, I'm starting with book one uh, of the early years, and he's just about finishing that. So I'll put that. I'll be able to put that up for you know um, as an audible book. Oh, awesome! Uh, it's Ma Malcolm Hillgartner, and he's a he's he's done it several of my other books, and he's really good. He's just got a great voice, and uh, and he's highly intelligent. He gets it, you know. So uh, between the two, getting it and reading it uh, with that great voice, it's really very exciting and uh, he's just finishing book one so I'll, I'm sure I'll have to do book two too but that's fantastic well the uh, the two new books the early years uh, the further serial crimes of George Hill Hodel MD um, out now uh, I highly out, encourage out now and uh, I'll have to go see what the, the one the last time I checked the ratings were about one millionth on Amazon so let's see Folks, to go ahead and get them if you haven't listened to the first uh, couple episodes. It was a two-parter uh, about a year back uh, with Steve. Um, we dive, you know, even deeper there and uh, and continued on uh, with the early murders here. So, deep, deep, um, deep. listen to those, check them out, go get the books, and uh, there's so books. much more evidence uh, in the books that we could couldn't possibly cover even if we had 15 episodes. Um, so, yeah. so go check them out, but. Um, as always, uh, thank you so much. It's always fascinating. Like I said, you always bring up. Always fascinating to see what Steve Hodell is going to come up with. A wealth of information. And, uh, it, you know, I could listen to you talk all day. So. <laughs> well, thanks, John. I, re I really enjoy doing it with you. And you've been. Uh... Yeah, John, uh, a friendly audience. No hard questions. Yeah. Nice job. Nice job. Yeah. I love your two prior episodes. They were great. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, oh, spooky music. Cue the spooky music. All right. Okay. I'm going to cut it off. Yeah, I'm going to cut it off there so I don't get a copyright strike for the, the spooky music. Um, 
I don't really have anything to add. I mean, if you get all the way to the end of this video, you deserve a gold scar, uh, a gold star, not a gold scar. Um, that's all for now. <clears throat> okay, wow. Um, that was a long one. And um, Steve really did say that it's Elizabeth Short in the Man Ray photograph, which is like, um, wow. Talk about detached from reality. Wow. All right, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna go check my bingo card and see how I did. So long for now. <laughs>